Well, good morning, church. Good morning, Alex. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm like, Vince is not here, and he's always like really loud here. But anyway, um, wow. Well, uh, I love you guys. It's, it's you. You almost gave. You know, you, you scared some people today. It was seven. Uh, I mean, uh, ten twenty-seven, and everyone was like, "Where is everyone?" I'm like, "Just trust me. The music will go on, and then this room will be filled with people." That's how it works here, you know. <laughs> and as soon as the worship team starts playing, you know, everyone's coming in. How, how do I know this? It's been like this for years, right? Uh, and, and so even when there's no one in the room, all we have to do is pick up the guitar and start singing a couple of, you know, some lyrics, and you're all just like flocking in here. And this is the way, church, and I, I love you guys. Um, so we're still going through the uh, book of Ezekiel. And I don't know if you just kind of like picked the book of Ezekiel up by yourself and you just started reading through it. And if you have, you notice that it's kind of like a little bit of a depressing book. Uh, there's, there's a lot of wrath of God in that book, right? And uh, a lot of punishment, a lot of threats. And at the end, just the very end of the book of Ezekiel, it, it just kind of like, hey, but at the end, I will, I will put you all back together. And we're going to be one happy family, right? And so as we're going through the book of Ezekiel, please uh, don't blame the messenger. You know, like, oh, this is, you're just preaching the wrath of God today. <laughs> no, <laughs> we're just going to be talking about what is written in, uh, in uh, this chapter today. So I'm going to start with a story. Um, so when I was 12 years old, somewhere around there, uh, my family... Uh, attended uh, First Baptist Church, right? Uh, the one in Liberty there. And so uh, since we moved to the United States, there was a very small uh, Russian Baptist uh, congregation, and they were all gathered in the First Baptist Church. And so we all became members in First Baptist Church, and then they gave us a, a room, and, and, and so all the Russians began to gather together there. And, and First Slavic Baptist Church was born uh, there. And so we would attend that church. And uh, as a Russian mischievous uh, child, you know, I really loved running around that big, big building you know, with, along with my friends. And so what we would do, we would just explore every single room. And there's a, a reason why it says, do not enter, do not enter, do not enter, don't unlock, you know. And we thought, enter, enter, and unlock, you know. <laughs> uh, just, that's the way how things work. And so we've done all those things. And the Americans, they were kind of like a little frustrated with, with the, the uh, Russian kids. And they're like, Dude, stop. Tell your children not to do this. Open means open and closed means closed. Do not open means do not open, right? And so they hired a janitor who was also a Russian. I think they did this on purpose because he would treat us a little rough, uh, right? And so he would chase us around all the time. And so every time we would be doing something, we see, like, oh, the janitor is here. And, and we run. Literally, this dude would, ro would chase us around the church, across the church, you know, from pew to pew. And most of the time, we would get away. And so one perfect evening, uh, we got into the main sanctuary where we were not allowed, uh, as, you know, to play around. And so we decided to play tag from pew to pew. Just kind of like running on pews and jumping from one to another, you know, just it's fun. And we're running around, and we're having the time of our lives. And all of a sudden, I see one of my friends just turn white, and he's like, oh, my God, run. And so everybody's running. And one of my friends, is, he's running by, and he says, like, Alex, it's the janitor. And this time, I don't know what got into my head, but I'm like, I'm going to prove this janitor wrong. I'm a good kid. And so I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make him think that I was sitting here contemplating on the cross. And so I was, uh, it was a front pew, and I, instead of running, I just sat on that pew, and I kind of held my chin like this, looking at the cross. What I was trying to do, I was trying to pretend, I was trying to make him believe that I'm thinking about the cross. And this Christian janitor would look at me, and he would say, like, oh, such a Christian boy. And he would say, like, wow, you're such a good man, and, and he's not going to do anything to me, right? And so as I'm contemplating on the cross... I feel this really, really hard slap in the back of my head. And then he grabs my ear really hard, and he pulls it back, and he says, I told you not to be here, <laughs> right? And I had the audacity to ask him, why? Why did you do this to me? And he says, because you're not listening. 
So with that story in mind, let's read Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 21 and 29 through 29. On January 8th, during the 12th year of our captivity, a survivor from Jerusalem came to me and said, the city has fallen. The previous evening, the Lord had taken hold of me and given me back my voice. So I was able to speak when this man arrived the next morning. Then this message came to me from the Lord. Son of men, the scattered remnants of Israel living among the ruined cities keep saying, Abraham was only one man, yet he gained possession of the entire land. We are many. Surely the land has been given to us as possession. So tell these people, this is what the sovereign Lord, Lord says. You eat meat with blood in it. You worship idols and you murder the innocent. Do you really think the land should be yours? Murderers, idolaters, adulterers. Should the land belong to you? Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. As surely as I live, those living in the ruins will die by the sword and I will send wild animals to eat those living in the open fields. Those hiding in the forts and caves will die of disease. I will completely destroy the land and demolish her pride. Her arrogant power will come to an end. The mountains of Israel will be so desolate that no one will even travel through them. And when I have completely destroyed the land because of their detestable, detestable sins, they, then they will know that I am the Lord. This is not the love in Jesus we're used to, right? <laughs> it's just uh, the one who holds the little lamb and just walks with the staff and just kind of like, you know, knocking on your doors type of deal, right? So this is not the Jesus we're used to. Right? We're reading about the wrath of God. So here's the story. Uh, Ezekiel was living in Babylon because when God decided to punish Israel, punish Jewish people, you know, they were sent into exile and Ezekiel was one of them. And sometime, some years later, maybe 10 years later, 12 years later, something like that, the final city, the main city, the city of Jerusalem, which held up for a long time, and then finally that city fell. And so this is happening here. The, one of the survivors, he comes to uh, Ezekiel and he says, like, hey, our capital, it fell. We are no longer a people. We're done. So as soon as the capital falls, there's no longer a people. It's just, it's just people. There's no longer a nation. He's like, as a nation, we are done. We are done. And so uh, I'm not really sure what happened to Ezekiel that day uh, or around that time when he says that God took his voice, right? Maybe God took his voice. Maybe that means that God did not speak to him and he could not speak on behalf of the Lord. Or it could possibly mean that God actually literally took his voice and he was silent for a while. And he says, that, that, but God gave me my voice back. And what's interesting is that uh, God says, you tell this person, you tell your people that I have a message for them, that basically I am not done being harsh with them. I am not done disciplining them yet. Why? Because they haven't learned just yet. They're just not listening to what I'm saying to them. They're not listening. And so as you're listening to this message, I want you to walk away with this. Maybe, maybe you are going through some things in life, calamities. Maybe, maybe you're seeing them in life, you know, hardships. And sometimes maybe you're thinking God is just wrathful with me. He is punishing me and he is, uh, and he is angry with me. And that's why he is doing this to me. It's possibly that God is disciplining you. Yes. But what I want you to walk away with is this, that you're going to learn this lesson at the end, that God is not doing it out of spite. I want you to walk away knowing who the Lord is. And this is the exact lesson that God is trying to teach Israel. So Jewish people were punished for their sins. King of Babylon came with his entire army and killed hundreds of thousands of people as he captured Jewish cities one by one, and at the end, the Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, it falls. Thousands of people were forced into exile. Ezekiel was one of them. Daniel was one of them, right? 
Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they were, they were one, some of the exiles, right? But some were lucky in the way. Some were left behind. And uh, yeah, yeah, I know they experienced the horrors of war and they they've seen things that no humans should see, but they stayed home. And they looked at all the people that went into exile and they probably thought, and, and this seems to be their train of thought, were like, well, they were more unrighteous. They were more wicked than us. And this is why God punished the land. It wasn't because of us, because I stayed behind. Well, this calamity really didn't reach me. I stayed behind. But God punished everyone else and my whole country. It must be them who sinned. It must be them who did, who's done all these detestable sins. And, and so they misunderstood. And in the way they thought that God favors us more. Because they kept saying, well, hey, look at all this land now. God took everyone away and put them, killed them, put them into exile. And he left us, the righteous ones, in this vast land. For the taken, it's ours. Oh, God must be looking favorably on me. But what they didn't understand was God sent a message, message through Ezekiel. God sent a message through Jeremiah to all of the Jewish people. Repent, repent, repent. All of them. That included them. That included them. And so they misunderstood the message, but, but the message was to them. And God says, I will do this and that if you don't repent. And they saw what God did. God kept his word. Uh, he fulfilled his word. And yet still they misunderstood. And I want us to draw a lesson from this. This is my point here. Sometimes you are deaf to God's warnings. Sometimes we are deaf to God's warnings. And now I don't know what you've been going through this week, this past couple of weeks, this past couple of months. But I'm pretty sure if you're a child of God, God has been speaking to you. And maybe there are sins that you need to leave, need to repent from. <coughs> Maybe, maybe there are choices that you've been, ma been making that are not God honoring and God has been warning you, has been talking to you, right? And he's, he's been giving you a warning. But we choose not to heed to those warnings. So God gave us this land, they said. In verse 25, I'm going to read it again. This is what the sovereign Lord says. You eat meat with blood in it. I had some really good steak yesterday. <laughs> and I like a medium rare. <laughs> right? Like, what are we talking about here? You eat meat with blood in it. You worship idols and you murder the innocent. Do you really think that the land should be yours? Murderers, idolaters, adulterers. Should the land belong to you? Well, God says, definitely not. And, but here's a question. And why was God so upset about eating meat with blood in it? And we can't just uh, isolate this specific uh, uh, instance here, right? Blood and, uh, eating blood, uh, worshiping idols, and murdering the innocent. And so if we read the scriptures, and if we read the law of Moses, God specifically, even to Noah, he says, do not eat meat with blood in it. He strictly forbade to eat blood sausage, <laughs> Right? That's it. He said, like, don't eat the blood of the animal, period. And then it explains a little bit more as we read Leviticus, Deuteronomy. He says, because the soul of the animal or the spirit of the animal is in its blood, drain it out. So that's something uh, mystical in there, right? So maybe it's the life of the animal is in its blood. So God says, don't, don't do that. Respect the animal. Respect the animal. Eat the meat. Kill it properly, right? Just uh, don't, you are not an animal, so don't, just, just do things properly. Don't do that. And so in the way what God was saying to Israel, show respect towards life. All life. So 
and what's interesting, in this specific sentence, he says, you have no respect for the animals. You have no respect for God. And you have no respect for people. Life of the animals is nothing to you. Life with God is nothing to you. And life of people is nothing to you. It's a simple message here. They're saying like, oh, we are favored by God. And so that's why God destroys everyone else but us. He's like, oh, no, no, no. You are misunderstanding the message here. And if we are to jump into the future, then we know who actually inherited that land. It was the exiles. They returned. They returned. So God punished them. God made the land rest. And so he took them into Babylon. He exiled them. And the people that were left behind, they were like, yes, you know, the land is ours. You know, let's take it. Let's take it. So they would grab the land. They would, you know, they would kill people, kill animals. They would continue to worship idols, thinking that they are righteous. They are misunderstood God's warning. God took the other people away just to tell them, this is what I can do. I do not deal well with idolatry. I do not deal well with your behavior. Stop, repent while you can. But they fell deaf to God's warnings. And so there's a problem here. People are not realizing that the calamity that was brought upon them was from God. They sinned. God called out to repent. They refused. They, uh, he punished them. And yet the remainder still found no fault in themselves. They thought that they were righteous. And so I thought about myself. Um, when God points out my sin and I refuse to admit that I am wrong, I will never admit that God is right. Do you get it? When God points out my sin, when he points out my behavior, when he points out my lifestyle, and I, and I hear that very loud and clear, and I refuse to admit that I am wrong, I will never admit that God is right. And when God points things out, God is right. God is righteous. He is the standard of right. Huh. And this is the problem. When the word of God points out something in my life, my natural response, oh man, we're so evil sometimes. Our natural response is, is to look at the, uh, to that same word and find why we are right. And so when the word of God tells me that I'm living a wrong lifestyle, that I'm committing a sin, I tend to look into that word of God and I go through the pages of the Bible just to find a reason, just to justify myself. This is why I'm doing it, God. And it's really interesting. So naturally, we tend to respond and we tend to argue with God that, no, God, I know you're saying I am wrong, but also let me tell you, let me, let me point you to Second Opinions 3.15. You know, it says that I am right, you know, and so it's your word against mine, God, right? And this is not how it works. God warns. God's word warns. It exposes. It convicts. It condemns sin. And there is no way around that. 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. I'm sorry, some uh, scriptures are not there because I forgot to mention it to Vilana. <laughs> My fault. So what does the scripture do? It is inspired by God and is useful to do what? To teach us what is true and is useful to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. And what else does it do? It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. So, and God does that because, because now I'm going to switch to Ezekiel chapter 3, 33 verse 11. And we read this last Sunday. Because 
God says, as surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked people. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so they can live. Turn, turn from your wickedness, O people of Israel. Why should you die? Man, and, and you definitely should read it just like that. <laughs> don't, don't be monotone when you read this passage. It is the heart of God. Yes, we see a lot in the Bible where God is just vengeful, wrathful, and, and he says, literally, says, I will kill some of you, right? And he says that, but the heart of God says, you know, like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I, what I want, I want you to turn. I don't want to do what I'm promising. I don't want to do that. I don't want you to die. I want you to turn from your sins. And this is his heart. And so for a wicked person, God's heart says, repent, and you will live. For a uh, non-Christian person, uh, repent, and you will live. And for a child of God, his heart screams, turn from your sins so you would enjoy our fellowship. Turn! Because when the child of God sins and lives in sin, the fellowship with God is not so sweet. It's hard. It's bitter. It's difficult. So there's a reaction for every action. There, there are consequences. Has God been warning you lately? Has he been warning you lately of whatever it is that he's been warning you? Because our second point, God's warnings stop. They don't last forever. His warnings stop. I play a dangerous game when I defy God's warnings. Not everyone had a chance to repent because they have not lived another day. Not everyone had a chance to repent. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says, Bad company corrupts good character. But we say, well, not us. I'm never going to be like them. Uh-uh. I hear that from my teenage or adult children now. It's just like, oh, no, no, no. We're, we're not like that, Dad. We're not like that. <laughs> Exodus chapter 20 verse 14 says you must not commit adultery but some say well everyone is doing it and so some Christians give in the wicked give in births outside of wedlock skyrocket divorces skyrocket households without a father skyrocket relationships are often ruined and so on so here is a word for a believer and a non-believer God's warnings they stop they don't all go on forever they stop sometimes whether it is a uh, to a wicked man who needs to repent or to a believer that lives in sin but you might say but there is Ezekiel chapter 33 verse uh, 11 again I'm going to read it as surely as I live, says the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked people. I want to explain this verse a little bit. How could he go against his own wish? Well, we can explain it tomorrow morning. When you're going to hear your alarm <laughs> and you have to get up for work. Your desire is to sleep in and not to go to work, but you're still going to do what you have to, right? To parents, when it comes to disciplining children, you know, you're a sick, sick person if you enjoy uh, disciplining your children. Like this, like, <laughs> I really love disciplining my children. It's, you know, no, <laughs> it's just like, most often we don't like to do that. We don't want to do that, but there comes a time when I have to do that. And here is a passage that I'm going to read that uh, I was not supposed to read, but I'm going to read it anyway. Uh, just as I'm preaching now, it came across. Second uh, uh, Thessalonians chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 9 uh, through 14, uh, through 12 actually. Right, so it's talking about the Antichrist who's going to come. It's uh, talking about Antichrist who's going to come. And listen to this. This man, Antichrist, will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. 
He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they will believe these lies. Then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. Now it sounds like, okay, this is horrible because this is a completely unfair one. No, this is a fair one. Why is God going to cause them to believe the lies? Why? Simple, verse 10. Because, because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So in a way it says that he gave them warnings. He gave them enough time. He preached the gospel to them. They saw it all. They saw the church. They saw God's people. He spoke to them personally maybe. He spoke to them through calamities maybe. But they still refused to believe the truth. Well, so what did God do then? So he said, well, he caused them to believe lies, and then he's going to punish them for that. Wow. Warnings stop. Warnings stop. So in a way, when we're looking at this specific verse, Ezekiel 33, 11, warnings stop. He does not want to, but he will do it. In the Isaiah 11, chapter 4, it says, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Oh man, this is a little, well, this is contrary to what he's saying. No, God does not want to do that. He does not want to kill. He does not want to destroy the wicked. He wants them to turn to him. But man, the warnings will stop. Let me tell you, God will always discipline his children. But when it comes to the wicked, the outcome is different. So let me show you something. I'm going to try not to butcher this. This is how, uh, this is how God's uh, mercy uh, or God's wrath works. God's wrath is, is I'm about to, ready to slap you, right? God's wrath is, is ready to be poured out, right? So I'm, I'm angry here. You can see that, right? And then God's mercy, God's mercy, it holds his wrath. And at the same time, God's mercy is calling. Come. Come. But then there comes a time when mercy withdraws and it releases God's wrath. And the unrepented sinner is only left with God's wrath. See the picture? I mean, I preached uh, a little while ago, uh, warn the people. <laughs> Warn the people. Please preach the gospel and warn the people that God's wrath is coming. Warn the people. They need to repent. Warn the people. And we got to continue to warn the people. And we continue to see people living in sin. And we must tell them that, that these warnings will stop. And sometimes maybe, hopefully not, but you might be left with just his wrath alone. And so if you love your neighbor, if you love your friend, if you love your whoever it is, just like tell them. But while God speaks, there is still mercy. So an unrepentant sinner is the one who is not covered by the blood of Jesus, is left with God's wrath only. Calamities and problems happen. But even then, even then, my final point here, consequences and calamities are there so we would know that God is Lord, that he is the Lord. Man, again, uh, he says, say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, as surely as I live, those living in the ruins will die by the sword, and I will send wild animals to eat those living in the open fields, those hiding in the forts and caves will die of disease. I will completely destroy the land and demolish her pride. Her arrogant power will come to an end. The mountains of Israel will be so desolate that no one will even travel through them. And when I have completely destroyed the land because of their detestable sins, then they will know that I am the Lord. So when I do not listen, when I shut my ears and scream, la, 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 I can't hear you, God. And sometimes God uses methods that are not that pleasant. This is not to show me that he is smiting me out of spite, out of anger. This is to show me that there is a sovereign God who is in charge. And that is not me. This has been the struggle since the garden of Eden. Man wanted to sit on the throne. 
Men wanted to be in charge. Men wanted to replace God. And we replace him sometimes in many aspects of life. We say we know better about relationships. We say we know better about finances. We know better about love. We know better about children. We know better about life. We, and so on and on and on. And we call the shots as if we were the ones in charge. And God says, I am the Lord. And if you don't believe me, then I will make you see it. It's horrible when God makes you see it. I prefer to just not be made to see. I just want to see. Why is this so important? Why does God want to be in charge so bad? Why does he care about being Lord? And why doesn't he want me to have that throne Look around. You're going to go home. You drive, drive in downtown Salem. You know, look around. Listen to the news. Read some news. The pain, the suffering, greed, separation, tears, bitterness, this fallen world, this filthy place, this nasty place. This is the result of our lordship. This is the result of our leadership. This is this what happened. This this happened when we took the wheel at the Garden of Eden. This is where we ended up because we are on the throne. My life is a mess when I am on the throne. My life is a mess when I am the Lord of every decision. My life is a mess when I am the Lord of my life. And God says to Israel, and he says the same thing to you today, I am the Lord. I don't want you to be the Lord of your life. Let me be the Lord of every decision. So as I look around, I see this is what we have done. God wants to be my Lord because only his Lordship will bring me joy and pleasure to him only his lordship will bring me joy and pleasure to him only his lordship and so the heart of ezekiel's message is this i will allow suffering if i have to so you would know that i am the lord so maybe you're going through suffering right now Maybe you actually know why. You're just not sure what to do. Please, don't think that God hates you. God allows suffering sometimes so you would know that he is the Lord. Is he your Lord? That's the question. Have you been running? Have you been facing consequences of your running? Have you surrendered your life to God? If not, I'm just going to tell you simply, repent from your sins now. Repent from your sins. Ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. And if you are a believer, is Jesus the Lord of all of your life? Or he's just the Savior to you? Is he the Lord of all of your life? Or just, is he just the Savior? Oh, he's just my Savior, but I'm the Lord of this, this, and that. Is he the Lord of all of your life? Is he the Lord of your marriage? Is he the Lord of your employment? Is he the Lord of your business? Is he the Lord of your extracurricular activities? Is he the Lord of your hobbies? Is he the Lord of your life? So let us examine ourselves. And let us surrender to his Lordship. And as the worship team comes back up here, and we're just going to, just for a minute, just, just think on this message. Just let it sink in a little bit. God, are you my Lord in everything? God, are you my Lord in everything? And so I pray that you would be inviting God to be the Lord of everything. And I pray that if you have been rejecting God and running from God, that you would be repenting his warnings stop and I pray that you would not turn a deaf ear towards them 
God, thank you for Ezekiel. Sometimes it's a depressing book to read because it's, it's so tough to see how sinful we are, God. It's not just Israel. It's us. We, we sin so much. We, Lord, we offend you on so many different levels, Lord. And you, you are a loving God, and you, you warn us. You warn us. You show us things. And sometimes we just turn a deaf ear towards you and we just refuse to listen, to, to understand. God, please, I pray for the way church. That if there is anybody in this church that have been receiving your warnings, Lord, I pray that they would fall to their knees and surrender to you, Lord. God, help us to surrender every aspect of our lives to you. So we would not just audibly proclaim you as Lord, but with our lives, we would show that you are the Lord of my life at home and in church, at work and at home, with my wife and with my kids. God, let it be. You are the Lord. You are the Lord, and we surrender. Pray this in Jesus' name.